Okay, can you hear me? Okay, today we're going to talk about a subject not directly related with small talk, but it is not directly, it's not unrelated, but it's directly related with small talk. Well, I'm Sir Marino, some of you know me, some of you don't. You prefer to stay that way. <laughs> um, and because I got so excited about the multiple things, I added a few extra examples. So if you have time at the end, I'm going to show you something that I was playing with, and now I extend it to actually build a tool to navigate the blockchain using the, the inspector of the platform. So let's get started. How many of you have heard the word blockchain? Raise your hand. Yeah, awesome. How many of you have used blockchain or cryptocurrencies or something? Good, good, Max. Well, blockchain is something that is overly hyped these days because it's sold as the cure for everything, from being fat to hair loss. And actually, it isn't. But it has a very, very good value that I'm going to, to I'm trying to transmit to all of you. So, Bitcoin. Actually, Bitcoin, yesterday, it was the 10th anniversary because it was published on the 31st of October in 2008. On the on a crypto, it was a cypherpunk's mailing list where this guy, or, or yeah, we don't know if it was he or she or a group of people, by the pseudonym of the uh, of Satoshi Nakamoto, okay, well, it's that one behind, um, proposed that peer to peer electronic cash doesn't need any intermediaries. So basically, what it removes is that you can transfer value from one person, one people, to the next without actually trusting the other people and without needing an escrow in between that could be a bank, an institution or anything else to, to register and, and prove that transaction. Well, the jumper is, we don't know who it is. Most of us believe that it was Halfin, who is now dead, and maybe Nick Sambo, who is still alive and writing. He didn't invent anything new. That's something that, that's very nice about this because it was based on many things that already existed. I'm going to go over a few of them. Oh, that's the thing. But this is something that I get kind of mad when people say, well, yeah, I like the blockchain thing, but Bitcoin is not useful. And look at actually everything one guy told me. And this is what I think about it. So, yeah, I like the car, but I don't like the engine. Well, it doesn't work that way. So, why not? Because I'm not. <laughs> okay, so why not? Because Bitcoin is money. To start with, forget about blockchain. Bitcoin is money. And money is one of the oldest technology that humanity had. Actually, if you find records of, of written things, the first thing that you can find written was actually like trade records, not actually spoken words. So, it's one of the oldest, I would say, and it's so naturalized, and this is a, the, a brand name of technology, as that some technology start going up that it makes invisible, and at some point it's so natural that we take it for granted that you don't see it anymore. It's not that always it's everywhere, it's just, it's beyond invisible. Same. This is actually where I think the world is, where it is described. And as such, as technology, it had several interactions. I won't go over the different types of money, but it started with seeds, with beads, with shiny rocks that you couldn't transport actually to, well, to precious metal, to coins, to paper money, to fiat money, and to cryptocurrencies. So, what makes a good money? I'm, I'm going to go over this money part just as fast as we can. Well, you have these attributes that I'm not going to go over all of them. And there is other attributes that some of them, the great ones, are the ones that actually did not apply because the precious metal and the field money is not programmable. And then you have Bitcoin that has, it, it exists of, at most of them. A unit of account is actually it's, it's the weakest part because its price is so volatile that it's hard to actually find a contract Nominated in Bitcoin, because one day it could be, it could cost you, you know, the wealth, the equivalent of wealth would be twice or half. So it's not a good unit of account now, because the actual volume of the whole Bitcoin 
the situation is a hammer billion dollars, which is funny enough. So, so compared to the like forty trillion dollars that is the whole wealth in bonds, in, in currency, in precious metals, and everything else, the small is you know, Bitcoin is it's not just yet. So, what qualities have Bitcoin over the, the rest of the money or over most of them? The currency. I mean, it is neutral. I mean, it doesn't have any political definition. It doesn't have anything. It's just like internet. It's neutral so far. It has free access. It doesn't require anybody to, to present credentials to actually operate on the network. It is distributed because it, you cannot take it down because it's it's a it's a network of uh, over yeah averaging ten thousand computers, not miners. We're talking about the network that knows. Uh, distributed globally. I will go over that, about the misconception about the Chinese concentration and stuff like that. So basically we have three three types of organizations. We have the centralized, we have this weak point. You have the decentralized, that is the way that most governments or big corporations or institutions work, but you basically have a kind of a pyramid that goes up and it has a weakest point or several weakest points and a strong weakest point at the center. And you have distributed which basically what the internet is. I mean, you, you can take down this whole thing, but well, this, this thing is going to be able to prove to this point because we can, we can find a path. It is borderless because well, it doesn't have any nation. You don't know where it came from and it doesn't have any in, in the code. And this is good. This is the first time I give a presentation about Bitcoin and blockchain to a room full of programmers. So this is most of them. Because it's, it's, Bitcoin is a software. You, you have to tell you about that. And it's censorship persistent. This is the most important quality, in my opinion, that Bitcoin has. Nobody can seize your money. Nobody. And that's, that's actually, it's, I mean, uh, there is, um, on the impact it has at the level of societies, it's very, very important. Because society is actually, those who are uh, grandsons, these days, of immigrants, have like grandparents that left their home country and left everything behind because they couldn't transfer the wealth. Because it could be confiscated, it could be stolen, it could be several things. Actually, you can transfer your whole wealth or savings in the Bitcoin, just remember the 12 words. Or saving something in a piece of paper that nobody can actually get. So, and this is very important. I mean, there is no government, no authority, nobody can, can take that down. And this will have um, um, impact on what I'm going to show you afterwards. Well, from the money side of things, it has a predictable supply. I won't go into the detail, but it has a, in the program, it has a consensus that it's going to uh, mint new coins at a rate that is predictable. And, and it, it's half the, the issue of new coins every four years. It's not four years exactly, but almost every four years. So by the year 2140, we're going to be approaching like a synthetic, like it's going to be around 21 million bitcoins, and, and that's going to be it. Actually, we're never going to reach it, it's going to be half every, every four years. But it's, it's intermediate because it doesn't need anybody else, and it's confidential. It's not private, I mean, you don't get privacy on, on bitcoin, it's confidential. So, if there is a distinction there, I will not go into detail now, but, but it's not private, it's not, it's not anonymous. And it's anti-fragile. And anti-fragile, this is a concept that something that when you get something that is uh, resistant, when it, it is un under stress, it preserves the, the, the natural or the state even with, with external stress. So something is fragile because it actually breaks down. When something well, is resilient, basically it can, it, 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 the, the stress comes in. Then it goes down and then it has the ability to, to, to go to the normal state. But something that is anti-fragile, this is the concept of, of Nassim Taleb, the, the guy who predicted the 2008 crisis, uh, well not predicted, but actually he, he saw it come to happen, um, is that something that is under stress, and when the stress passes, it becomes stronger. And this is something that the Bitcoin that has been under attack for a lot of time, even that not explicit <coughs> attack sometimes, network attack, and sometimes it was like, okay, we're going to censor this in this country and stuff like that, and it, it still continues moving. I mean, it's unstoppable. So, 
Why I like this thing? Actually, this is one of the things that mixes different activities like the distributed system, things from the cryptography, it has economic factors, it has governance factors, and in the middle, it is Bitcoin. And now, this is all. Well, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin, then I'm going to talk about blockchain and other stuff more later. But this is important to know because it works because it aligns in, in economic incentives. It has a very good governance model, unless there isn't there isn't a governance actually. But it has rules of consensus and ways to, to move forward to make changes. So, what is the basic crypto and cryptocurrency? I mean. Because it's a short talk, I didn't talk about currencies. But the basic crypto and uh, Martin make a good help talking about hash because most of what happens in, 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 in cryptocurrencies is related with the cryptographic hash functions. And one of the characteristics of uh, cryptographic hash functions is it has a fixed size output, which is deterministic. I mean, there is there's the same input as long as you produce the same output always. It has an avalanche effect. So you change a single bit in the, in the input as long as you produce a completely different output. And it, it is a one-way function, as I know, most hash functions at all. So basically you cannot go from the hash to the original one. And the other building block, or, or the basic building block, is the public key infrastructure of digital signatures. This is the way that, that you are basically having a wallet where you save your bitcoins is having a, a private key where with which you can sign the transactions to move your funds on the on the blockchain. And the, the public key is used to verify that you actually sign it. This is a basic digital signature scheme. So we have blockchain. Blockchain was uh, the, 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 the term was coined by Satoshi in his paper. Well, actually, he didn't, make, he didn't mention blockchain in the paper, he mentioned it afterwards. But it works as an append only letter. So basically, you can only add data to that, you can never delete the data. So, and because each page of this so called letter, which actually is a letter structure, is linked with the previous one, or it's linked in a cryptographic way. because. The, there is a note that it, it is involved with the mining itself, but basically the hash of this one is one of the fields of the next block. So if you modify, let's say you go back and modify this block where you want to send some transaction back to you, whatever, you will have to modify all the, all the blocks that are ahead of it. So computationally, now this is impossible. I mean, it's, you don't have the whole computing power of the world will only be able to modify maybe one block. That is this one, maybe. And, but it hasn't happened. So basically, with, with six confirmations, this actually, let's say your block is the your transaction got in the, in the block uh, 11, and you are, or the block 12, and, and you're in the block 18, you get finality. So basically, it's, it's impossible for the foreseen Decades, so the computer power can reverse that. So it's, it's actually it's an immutable question. And this is important. This is the decentralized part, but actually reaches consensus without having uh, a third party in providing authority. It's, it's the network itself, the software, and in, in the way it works that that provides that consensus. So there are many blockchains, right? And as People talk about blockchains, of different things. There is everybody talking about getting some kind of blockchain for their project. And most of the time, they don't need one. But there are two main group, groups of, of blockchains. There is the public blockchains, the one that actually they don't have you know, requirements to participate. So Bitcoin is one, there is another one that's called Ethereum that you might hear of because it's not here. The most um, known of the, of the blockchains <coughs> is trustless. Basically, you participate in that and you don't trust in it. You always verify, but actually, the model is trust and uh, it's verified, not trust. Actually, like, it's pretty much like what Mark is saying. Well, it doesn't have a, a <coughs> access, I mean, it's, it, the access is restricted. And it, 
most of them, except for, for a few ones, are pseudo anonymous. Basically, you don't get anonymity on, on them, but you, unless there is an, some rule, some data, something that attaches or links you to your actual identity, you can operate in an anonymous way. But it's not anonymous. But you don't have to use your, your government your yeah, government ID or anything to participate. You just download something and start that's the point. They have native assets, basically, and Bitcoin only can manage Bitcoin because it's, it's the, the asset that works there. Ethereum is the same thing. Basically, it, it manages digital assets in this case. And the, the solutions they provide are basically radically different solutions to existing problems. It's not like we're optimizing the banking system. We're basically creating a bank for everyone. This is what Bitcoin provides. It's not something that actually requires, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a leap in the way of thinking of, of fixing a problem or actually eliminating the problem itself. They are, most of them are illegal. It's not that they are illegal. Actually, in Argentina, it is legal. In most like, rational countries, it is legal to, 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 to have um, Bitcoin or all the cryptocurrencies, but because it doesn't have any jurisdiction, it, it, it isn't like in, in a limbo. They are public domain, basically the code is open to anybody to review. They're open, the, most of the time the, the, the data that's recorded on, on those public blockchain is open and anybody can audit it. Actually, in Argentina, the Boletin Oficial, that is the, the record where all the government decisions are published every day. It is recorded on the blockchain since a year ago. This is not, this is not the full Boletin uh, Oficial, actually, it's the hash of the Boletin Oficial. So if anybody goes back and wants to force it, it would be easily checked for that somebody comes here and hit the record of all this. This is, the, the, I would say, the, the most common cases for public blockchains. And there are also the private blockchains, because blockchain as a solution um, of not having to trust the third parties could help improving um, processes of other of System, system solutions or industries or activities. But most of private blockchains are private because to participate in that in that blockchain you need actually access. If someone have access. There is a federation that gives you an ID to participate, there is, you have to sign a legal contract or something. But they're trusted most of the time. I'm just generalizing here, they're always the mixers. But most of the time they're trusted. I mean all the participants trust that blockchain. Or trust the other participants. And this is what I told you. They may have special consensus rules. In Bitcoin, actually, I'm not talking about it uh, now, but the way it reaches consensus, I think it was the, the most creative things that, that Satoshi did was to use the proof of work to reach consensus without um, to solve a, a distributed consensus problem known as the Byzantine Generals problem, basically, where you cannot trust um, in other parties or, or, or the network will reach consensus even if, uh, or even now this, only with 51% of the network agreeing on each other. And this, the, the private blockchains, they don't need that. They don't need to have computers mining or, or running CPU cycles just to get hashes or something like that because they, they might have the special consensus rules. They may say, okay, it's just this is a kind of democracy. If seven of the ten participants say it is okay, then it is okay. So, and they most of them they map different type of assets. Actually, there are uh, shipping companies registering, registering uh, shipments in the blockchain. There are the people registering, uh, for instance, uh, books or. or you see, what they, they do is they tokenize the physical assets and they create a, a digital representation of that, action, of that asset. But this is the, the part that I, I would like to highlight, is that most of the private block, uh, blockchains, what they do is to improve the processes of existing blockchains. They don't, I mean, the banks are not going to, to create something that will take 
them out of the scene. They actually they are improving their uh, lowering the cost of international transfer. They are making you know, interoperations. Actually, most of the private blockchains are using the fintech industry and actually for the banks to pass documents around because, uh, without having to trust each other. And they have little compliance because it's actually it's a private. It can be defined in their, in their own terms and. It is tamper evident. This is something that Bitcoin, for instance, has to be tamper proof. I mean, nobody can alter the ledger. In the private blockchain, because it has some legal compliance, the blockchain only has to be evident. I mean, some, if somebody is altering some record, it only has to be evident that some malicious participant altered it. And then the, the traditional legal ways will resolve that problem by like kicking them out of the the, the whole blockchain or whatever legal conditions they have. The debt is private because they don't have, they have to share public, uh, yeah, public is the, the data is stored there. And then there's the three more well known technologies. This is actually, this is called the call it corporate to, to sell it. They don't say blockchain or not most of the time, they call it DLT, which is, stands for distributed debt technology. It's just a, Fancy way to, to say blockchain. This hyperledger with this is an open source, uh, open source project from IBM. The original was uh, the IBM blockchain that was under the Linux Foundation umbrella. Uh, this is Monax. There is Core that is one for for banks. There are hundreds. Of them. So consensus basically it went, went from the private to the public. You have different trade-offs. So, you have, in Bitcoin, you have less trust because you don't trust the other parties and and you, you, you get very, very bad performance for the like, uh, you, you need to, to put millions of thousands of transactions per second. You cannot do that in Bitcoin. Actually, it's really slow now. There are some second layer solutions, as they are called, but at this moment, if that is small, it's not the main use that we have. So basically, this is the different type of consensus that you can, you can have. On one side is the proof of work, with all the CPU, it uses all the energy and all that stuff that sometimes is a critique of, of, of Bitcoin, but actually it's the way it has to... to, to uh, actually, the best way, and there's no other mistake created that can't provide consensus without trusting in anybody else, because it has an economic factor to go to work against the consensus. And in the middle you have well, proof of authority, basically it's like a voting thing. And the full authority consensus is basically you have anything anybody can, can can write whatever they want. And this is this is different algorithms that uh, that provide consensus. Actually this one is the one used by Ethereum, but well, it's not used by Ethereum, the plans you use but they can't get. It's a different one but basically like a democracy implemented where you delegate your representation to somebody and that somebody has uh, the right to make decisions on the blockchain on your behalf and you can take that representation but it has its use, it, uh, its issues in it. So, choose your point. This is a simple flowchart that in 99% of the cases it will send the views. Because as I say, most of the time you don't need a blockchain. Well, it is just one to read, but and in some cases where you, you can end up in a private blockchain or a public blockchain, and as I see it in the near future, there's going to be a, a lot of collaboration between the private and the public blockchain. Basically, the same way that internet was a big thing in the '90s, and then everybody started to. I mean, internet are still a thing, but internet is like the ultimate network that connects them all together. And smart contracts. How many of you have heard the word, the word, the word smart contracts? Okay, good. Well, the smart contracts is an exaggeration, as you said. Because they're not smart, they're just programs. Basically. But the difference between a smart contract uh, and a Bitcoin smart contract is that what is called a smart contract is a truly complete language that can be executed in the network. Basically, you 
You create a program, you upload it to the blockchain, and once you upload it, it runs. I mean, it runs every time you want to interact with it, but you cannot modify it. And there is an economic cost to most the of, the, of the, the smart contract blockchain, that Ethereum, to actually run the piece of smart contract. So if you want to have, for instance, uh, smart contracts that will pay you an insurance that you get on, on smart contract blockchain, well, that, that execution is going to get, cost you some gas, that is the, the price that, that you have to pay to execute that program. And actually, the gas is calculated by, by bytecodes. So every, every bytecode that you execute, you're, you're going to have to pay more. Well, the key feature that it has is that it's autonomous. Basically, you upload it and you execute no matter what. So there is, you have to trust anybody to actually, let's you know, say, buy something and you need somebody to make the payment. So if all the conditions are met, the smart contract will execute automatically. It can hold a transfer asset. Actually, you can have uh, what's called a DAO, that is a distributed autonomous organization that basically it is a, a set of, 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 of smart contracts that actually can have its own accounts of money in some cases, and the conditions to move the, uh, that money will be determined by the rules written in this smart contract. It is immutable, also, and I wouldn't say that all of them are immutable, but so basically it means that nobody can roll back change because of the, and all the uh, nature of the blockchain. And well, this is executed by every miner, so, so every, every, every time a block is produced, the smart contract is going to be propagated by a mistake by, by the whole network. So what are the applications for a smart contract, which is not another overly hyped word? Well, FinTech is one of the, the most uh, demanding uses for that. So basically you can do trading, all the things that you have to use a platform relying on, on, the, on the program of that platform to execute the rules, let's say, like the Kickstarter. You could implement the Kickstarter using, using a smart contract, basically. Everybody send money to a particular address. You put the condition that when a certain amount is reached, you you send the money to the one that owns the project. And if the money on I mean, a certain date is getting reach the, the money you ask, then the, the money is refunded to the to the contributors without requiring anybody to 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 do that. And by anybody, I mean no company. I mean you can just trust anybody that is. Wanting to raise funds. The same thing to micro lending, you can create contracts that actually uh, lend money to somebody and the interest is charged automatically, and there are a lot of optimization of that. Oh, I put co funding two times because I like it too much. Since you have insurance, you can, you can create uh, insurance between parties. So basically, there is somebody figured out a way to create uh, an insurance company for anybody that wants to buy. So basically, you just Copy that smart contract persistently to yourself, or there is one that you can use and program it in a way that you can use it to issue insurance to other people, and you can you can issue insurances to your friends, for instance, and they have to pay you. And because everything is automatically executed, there is no way that they can cheat you. Uh, well, in IoT, there actually this is something that's already happening that because. Bitcoin is, or any other crypto, is not only for persons. I mean, you can have a wallet on the vending machine. I mean, the, the vending machine can have its own balance of how much money it has. So basically, it can. In, there are some experiments where the, the some devices actually send money to other devices to pay, where they handshake and can actually exchange funds without going to a, a person or so forth, just, they just go to the network. Uh, supply chains, logistics is using this a lot because there are a lot of parties involved in mean, something from the very moment that something in, for the crops, for instance, is for, for producing wine or everything, so you can get all the, the, the state of the of what's let's say you have a bottle of wine and it's very expensive, so you want to make sure that the temperature that that bottle, that bottle of wine has never went above or below 
a, a certain range. So basically, that has a sensor that's writing all the data to the blockchain, and because that is publicly accessible, it doesn't matter how many participants transfer that bottle of wine or that load of wine. You, you can check yourself, or, or any party can can check that that data was in force. Of course, there are, there are different. I mean, somebody can put something near the sensor and, and cheat the sensor. But I mean, the, the, the idea is that you, you can actually trace the, the, the whole history of something without having to rely on the earlier participants. So basically, you trust the data, and you trust that the data cannot be changed. So that's the most important part. Well, government can have public records. I mean, if government, instead of sending the money through just regular wire transfers internally, and they can have accounts for each uh, organization you know, of, the, of, the, of the government, that could be made public. I mean, you don't have access to the accounts of the government, of course. You know, and not anybody has. If you use that, you can see money moving, I mean, because that's a public data, actually, it should be public. Well, some projects there are lots, I won't go, this is just an example. In food safety, there is a lot related to the things that, actually, this is, most of them are using hyperledger, this is the, 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 the is, uh, for private um, blockchain. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration for the state is, is working on something, Mars already implemented something for the, for the drug and food shipments. Um, what else? So, I've been working with Smallfoot for 15 years now, and in the previous two years, I was very close to this. Actually, I was participating in something that was like fast for Smallfoot, but it was for, for Bitcoin and blockchain, which is the, the NGO Bitcoin Argentina. And one of the things that, that, that is new, and many participants are wanting to, to actually use, beside all the hype that is around this, is the mutable record. Now you have an immutable record that nobody can out. In particular, if you are working on a public blockchain like Bitcoin, which is the ultimate immutability. This one that it provides. And what we see, in particular if those that are from earlier days than me, in, in this micro world, is that it's not just that companies are just trying to play with this, they are no investing into this because most of them believe, and some of them have been proved right, that this is a strategic advantage for them, for the business model. And this is something to, to matter because decentralized things spread faster. It's just a network effect that grows exponentially. And now, and this is something relatively new, there are a lot of efforts as in the, in the early days of, of anything. There are competing implementations for everything. But there is a, when you reach some scale, the cost of interoperation starts to get bigger. So the effort to collaborate uh, it has an economic incentive. So actually they started to collaborate and to define certain standards or protocols or specifications. For instance, there is there are specifications for for the project tokens, there are specifications for non-fungible tokens, let's say. Actually, one of the uh, applications it has in gaming, it is, for instance, there's a standard that you can have, let's say you have, you're playing an, an online game, and you have a character that actually it took you like two years to reach, to go from level zero to level 70, and you don't want to play that anymore. But because it, you can sell that now, there's a standard, uh, there is, I think it's ERC 720, but actually it's working to, to create non-fungible elements. So, so let's say, they create this, and this is a digital thing that cannot be forged because you cannot duplicate that asset on the, on the blockchain. This is something you go into. But that's, there, there are many things going on on that, on that way. So, and this is something to think about. There is a more model about how technology is get spread with the other diffuse. Actually, when, when you see this, uh, it also, it can, you can also can see it as an ass that goes this way. But, so basically you have the enthusiasts that get early into, into this new thing, basically the nurse or whatever thing it is. And you have the visionaries that, okay, these are crazy, but maybe there is something going on there. 
And this, and when you're here, you're the alternative, the, the alternative, I mean, group of, of people with some area of knowledge. Then there is the chance, actually, the, 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 the quality is crossing the chance. So many technologies die here. But those who can actually cross the chance can reach the pragmatic. So people that say, okay, this, oh, I, I don't care about your philosophy, about your need in the bank, or whatever, but this is useful, or let's use it. And that's what's called in this, by George Moore, the, the early majority. Then you have those conservatives that basically don't want to get something, but they have to. And at the end, you have the skeptics that don't have, they've been like resisting most of the time, you know, by will, to adopt something new. It's like my dad getting WhatsApp. It took like yeah, years, but when I changed my phone, it gave my phone, and now it's using WhatsApp, and sending pictures, and stuff like that. But it took like 10 years to do this. And, and that is the mainstream. Um, and there's also this effect of the novelty that's called the Zungi effect, which, is, which says that technology, the, the, the chance of survival of that technology grows as that technology gets older. So basically, if you don't die early, you have more chances of surviving later. It's the opposite of biological urban. So the more time you stay around, the more time you have, uh, the more chance you have to, to stay around for a, for a good time. And we as phone talkers, we've been called dead for so many times that actually this is being proven through, well actually this is the rare good paper, that is being proven through many times. So, I want to talk about this in a small conference as well, because Marianne insisted on the, on the, on the option. And, but I think that this is a new invention that is very relevant, and inventions cannot be an effect. And once it is spread, you cannot go back from that. There's a new thing that you now you can disintermediate trust for a lot of activities. This is a multidisciplinary field of activity. What it means is that it's, um, at least from my experience, it affects the same way that the internet did in the early and the early times. Basically, it affects everybody because it's going to reach most of the activities or yeah, industry activities, etc. And our life tools, I think this is a life system, in particular for the public blockchain, the life, I mean they have not stopped. Bitcoin has been running from not ten years because it started running on January 3rd of 2009. But it's been running non stop since then. And our tools are very good to work with life systems, or we are specialized in that. And this is why the, the part that I say that it's worth for an individual, maybe not the responder as a whole, but just an individual, is an early internet stage of development. I mean, everything is yet to do. And there are a lot of things that need to be done actually in tools. I see the tooling. And of some um, development environments or, or parsing, <coughs> or well, not of cryptography because that's a very low level thing, it's a very specific area. But there are a lot of things to, to build for this and to get uh, a chance of, of doing something that differentiates us from the rest on this particular area. So, and this is the last, uh, last thought about the, this is like a, an ad from a chocolate company from, from France in, I think it was in 1912, so it's 100 something years ago, where people were actually seeing each other talking by a video phone or something like that, and the, to the Chinese, basically from France. And this is the, the same chocolate company delivering the chocolates by satellites. They didn't see the drones, but they see the satellites. So this might not be as crazy as Amazon delivering packages by drones these days. And what I mean with this is that I find a lot of analogies in, in this to, to the small definition of things. Is that the best way to, to predict the future is to build it? So I think that this is not exactly like this, but this blockchain technology 
even if, it, if it's in an early stage, although it's 10 years old now, we're going to get to a point where it's going to change the way the trust operates in the world. This is, this is a very, very deep uh, thought that I have. I mean, it's already disintermediated thing, but it's going to disintermediate a lot of things that are going to change the way that you interact or you interact in the relation with trust or the part of trust. So, this is the end. How is the time? Okay, how about a few minutes? I wanted to show you that. Let me see. With the help of Andre here, I was building something like. No, see, 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 see. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh. You see that? Yeah. Oh, I don't see it now. No, I'll allow the cake, I'll allow the cake. Well, this is basically a, there's a tool in the, in the Bitcoin world or any blockchain that that's called a block explorer. That actually you get info from the blockchain, I don't know what it's green there, let's put it here. And let's say you want to get the last block from the, this is connected to a Bitcoin node that I run. Network it works now. I, I get the last block from the, from the blockchain. This is the very last block from the Bitcoin blockchain. I can see it has a list of transactions. All this may have some properties. And let's say I pick any transaction at random. Okay, this is telling me more attributes. I can get, for instance, that the transaction well, it moved very yeah, 0.03 something Bitcoin and it gave 0.0005 Bitcoin. As a fee to the miner, it, the, the funds came from these two, uh, these two inputs. This has to do with the way that the, the Bitcoin works because in Bitcoin there is no account. Basically, to, to build the balance, you have to, to process a whole chain of those transactions to, to get to the final balance. So, basically, this, this one takes these two coins here and sends two coins there, which are almost the same but not quite. And I can actually see where it went, and I can see it here, I can see that the, the script, I mean the, the internal script that uses Bitcoin to actually verify that you can move the, the funds is this one. So this is a, a typical, this is a, the Bitcoin uses a, a, a fork-like language that uses a, a, a stack. So basically it has the, the instructions to validate if you provide your uh, digital signature to move those, those funds. So this is something that I, I implemented in like you know, half an hour or so, with the help of Andre, of course, but it can show that actually you can, if I had the tools, I could create a transaction from here and send it and just be connected as I am connected to the internet, but instead of being connected to the internet of, of computers, I could be connected to the, what's called the internet of money, because this, in the case of Bitcoin, that's what it is. It's not just a currency, it's not uh, uh, the currency of the internet is the internet of currency. That's, that's what, what Bitcoin is these days. So, that's the small show of this. I can go over and go show you, for instance, how much money this block got here. Okay. This that happens when you make that many changes. Well, same thing. So, questions? Yes. Kit repository versus blockchain. Similarities, differences? Well, talk to the people. I mean, there is no. To, to store data on a blockchain, in particular in a public one, it has an economic cost. Right? And it has economic cost not only of storing the data in the blockchain. For which you can actually in Bitcoin is very limited what you can store. It has to be the order of bytes, not the order of megabytes. And that's going to be propagated, and in the case of Bitcoin, it's going to live forever, in practical terms, in the Bitcoin blockchain. So it has no practical reason to be there, I believe it's going to be slow. But you can actually 
we made a piece of code, hash it, and publish the hash on the internet, and we can prove, actually there are platforms now to do that in a more organized way. But actually one of the issues there, there's a lot of things stored in the blockchain, that's a liability that the people on blockchain has, for instance, there is pornography, and the group of the bad one, not the good one, um, on, the, on the internet and on the blockchain, and you cannot remove it. There, there is a lot of things, this is a new thing, I mean, the, the, the immutable record is the, the, the new thing that is available for developers to work with. But for instance, there is a company of cars in Argentina, they have a process where you save money and you, you make payments, and sometimes you can make an offer to get it you know, bid for that car, and that company is actually building a process to make it transparent. So basically, there, nobody can say that somebody who was a friend of somebody get the, get the best bid or get some inside information to, to make the right bid. So all that information is going to be public. So that's that's what it provides. And it cannot be rolled back. So it, no, it's not like, oh, hey, we went to that, that guy. We talked about, I was going to get it. Because that data cannot be cannot be rolled back. Basically, that's the immutable, the immutable thing that cannot be uh, it's that censorship resistant is the most important thing of uh, a Bitcoin record, I would say. 